It's a two-for-one deal when it comes to Predators report cards today. We got Matias Ekholm and Dante Fabro, two stalwarts of the Predators blue line. In Matias Ekholm, do you still see him as that cornerstone on defense that we thought he was a couple of years ago? And for Dante Fabro, will he ever develop fully into that first-round two-way defenseman the Predators thought they were getting when they drafted him? And if he doesn't, does he still have value to you? as a Nashville Predator. We'll talk about that today in the Locked on Predators podcast. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked on Predators your first listen of the day every single day. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at OnTheForeCheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I am Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer at OnTheForeCheck.com. And your favorite topic today, Swedes. Swedes. I could talk about the Swedes all day, baby. The Scandinavian blood that runs through your veins is coming into... uh, into play today because we're talking right. about your good buddy matthias Ekholm, the I big know. swedish redwood yeah uh bearded blue liner <laughs> that's a great one yeah the that's swedish smash skater yeah yeah the scandinavian scalperizer we can yeah, workshop this we're yeah. gonna workshop this matthias yeah. Ekholm is getting a nickname uh at some point Yes. We'll we'll see to that. Uh, yeah. And then we also have Dante Fabro on the mm-hmm. agenda today. One of probably the most controversial Predators to talk about just because it seems like every Predators fan you talk to has a different mm-hmm. varying opinion of Dante Fabro. So hopefully we'll, you know, find a nice little middle ground, try to separate some of the emotion out of it and just yeah. go into what he's done on the ice this year. Uh, so, yeah, kind of an interesting to stop. It's interesting topic to talk about. Yeah. Too many, yes. too many stupid T's in that sense. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, Did you watch? Little, do I, I was just going to ask you if you watched the Lightning and uh, Rangers game last night, just real quick. Did you catch any of that at all? Yeah. I, I okay. Did. Saw it from start to finish. And uh, okay. I think the New York Rangers are in trouble. I was going to ask you if you think the Lightning suddenly have the momentum shifting. Well, what did I say when we were kind of previewing this game the other day? Yeah. I said, if this goes to two to two, whoops. Look out. (laughs) Yeah, because now obviously the Rangers have played lights out at Madison Square Garden this year. Mm -hmm. So a little bit maybe of a different story. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, you've given the back-to-back Stanley Cup champions big momentum. Yes. Remember, the Rangers were up 2 nothing in game three. And then they were. They should have <laughs> closed the deal when they had the chance because now you have a best-of-three showdown with the Tampa Bay Lightning, and I don't care that you haven't lost at home since game one of the uh, the opening round. It's the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yes. And yeah. They may be the best team in the NHL right now. So I don't really think the Rangers want to go into a best of three showdown, even though two of the three are in New York. Yeah. I think it's going to be interesting, the whole home ice advantage, especially in this series. Um, because Madison Square Garden is kind of a tough place to come in and play, but the Tampa Bay Lightning, once they start rolling down the hill, that snowball gets huge. And I I put nothing past the Lightning in this series. You know, as great as the Rangers are, as great as they are at home, if they go into Madison Square Garden tomorrow night and get a win, like, mm, pass the Tums around New York, friends, because it's going to hurt. Yeah. yeah. Interesting series, though. I am loving this series. I am loving this series. It's super fun. Um, yeah. Definitely, like, more fun than the, the 4-0 sweep on the other side of things. Oh, yes. Yes, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, if if you're a Rangers fan, you're probably uh, looking back at that two nothing blown lead in yes. Game Three and thinking, "Is was that was that it? Was that the yeah. turning point right there?" Yeah. So, yeah. This lots is going to be. Left. Yeah, it, and and you know you never know, but this this just got real interesting in the East. Real interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Predators report cards. Let's yes. kick things off with Matthias Ekholm. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of a up and down season for Ekholm. Mm -hmm. Offensively, one of his better ones uh, in the past couple of years, at least when you're talking about points per game. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he's definitely kind of back to where he was a couple of years ago. Um and uh, yeah, like it's there, there's a lot to like about his game, but it just seems and so many times throughout the season when you and I were talking about, you know, players that were hot players that were cold, it seems like we were always talking about at home in one side of that spectrum or the other. Mm -hmm. And that's not exactly something you want from yes. your, you know, defenseman who's kind of supposed to be the workhorse shutdown guy of that core. Yeah, he was very hot and cold this season, which isn't what I associate when I think of Matthias Ekholm's play. Matthias Ekholm is like all good Swedes. He is sturdy. He is reliable. He is, you know, he's just steady. And this season was very up and down, I felt like, in spurts for, for Ekholm. And the down ones were concerning to me uh, because we don't, we haven't seen Matthias Ekholm really struggle for the Predators in, in a long, long time. I mean, he's just steady, sturdy. He is reliable. He is exactly who he is. You know exactly what you're getting from Ekholm. But he was up and down this season you know, and he is a core player, I think, for the Nashville Predators. And while you had some of these other core players like Yossi and Forsberg and Duchesne and even Granlund having these great years, Ekholm was one of those players that I thought at some point he's going to bust out too. And it just continued to kind of be up and down for him, which was kind of surprising for me. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you mm -hmm. think he hasn't kind of been – that consistent everyday guy this season? Is it mm -hmm. partnership? Is, you know, is there, you know, the fact that, you know, whether it was Fabro or Carrier, whoever he was with most often, um, you know, it, that kind of, you know, there's something not quite right between those two mm -hmm. or is Ekholm, you know, is that kind of more of the player he is? I am going to attribute it to just you know, as well as or as strong as I thought the defense or reliable, consistent as I thought the defensive pairs were going to be this season. That is not how it walked out for the Predators, especially that third line pairing. And I think that led to more shifting, even in the top part of the defense, the top pairings of the defense. So in my mind, of course, I excuse everything with Matias at home. And so I'm going to chalk it up a little bit to that. Um, but there were some other areas of his game that I don't think were as good as they should have been or could have been and not necessarily his fault. Like one of the huge areas that I would have loved to see at home have maybe a stronger season in is kind of uh, quarterbacking that second power play unit and the huh. second power play unit. Not not so much this season. And and I don't know that that really is an Ekholm thing. I think some of the guys that they felt like were going to be on that second power play unit, like Tolvanen and Tomasino maybe didn't deliver. Um, but yeah, there, there was something just not as consistent in Ekholm's game. And, you know, at the end of the season, you know, kind of exit interview, locker clean out, you know, he was very upfront and said, look, I didn't feel tired. I didn't feel physically worn out by the end of this season because he's Swedish and we're sturdy. But so it's not really that. So I don't, I mean, I don't want to just blame it on, you know, other players, but there was something that affected his consistency this season. I don't know. What do you think it might have been? 
Well, I kind of want to get into that in a second uh, mm-hmm. because there's also some good parts of Ekholm's game. For sure. Um, first, though, I want to mention today's show brought to you by our friends at Rock Auto with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models on the road. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you ever need. So why would you even get up off your couch, waste time going to the dealership and all that good stuff or an auto parts store? Instead, stay in the comfort of your own home and log on to rockauto.com. You save time and money when using Rock Auto. Uh, Everything they have there is 30, 50, or even 100% less than you would find at a normal chain auto parts store or dealership. Their family business has been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, and their prices are reliably low for every single customer. If you need anything, if you need parts to fix your brakes, they have it. If you have a busted tail lamp, they've got it. Uh, If your kids or your dog or whatever has absolutely made a mess of your seats and upholstery or your carpet, they have that too. Even if you just need an oil change, they have that, that all kinds of motor oil, fuel injector cleaners, pretty much anything you need to keep your t- car or truck in tip top shape. So go to their easy to use website today to find the solution to your auto parts need. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. And when you're there, be sure to write locked on in their How did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. So before the break, Ann, you asked, um, yeah, you, you kind of asked my thoughts on Ek Combs' inconsistencies. Yes. You know, let's say that. I do think you we need to look at parts at what's worked for Ek Holmes' game this mm-hmm. year. You know, six goals, 25 assists. That's pretty good for, yes. you know, a second, you know, pair defenseman. You know, there is that kind of secondary setup there. Um, so there is a lot to like about Ek Holmes', Holmes game. And when mm-hmm. he was on, he was also yes. – very on like he had some very very strong games uh where he was just making play after play after play in his own end really solid um but it's just you know i think what's frustrating is we would see that part of ekholm you know Mm -hmm. we would see him have these great games um and then you know flash forward the next week and he's just making Plays that kind of make you think there is a lack of focus there sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. Just not very good hockey IQ plays. Um, other times you just kind of like, you know, lack a days ago in his own zone, would lose track of, you know, somebody, you know, cutting towards the yes. net, lose track of his man, maybe not be in the right position. Um, it's very, very frustrating to see Matias Eichel because we know it's there. Like we have seen honestly last season, not this past season, we just played, but 20, uh, 2021, you know, where mm-hmm. the predators really had to have that epic comeback to make it into the postseason. If it wasn't for UC Soros, you could make a case for Matias Eichel being the Preds MVP that season. I yes. mean, that's how good he played, you know, when Yossi uh, was hurt for a little bit, when you had guys just like falling out of the lineup on a weekly basis, Ryan Ellis was hurt for a while. Matthias Ekholm was the guy that stepped up and mm-hmm. carried the entire load of that Nashville Predators defense on his back. So we yes. know it's there. It's just, it's frustrating to see plays from him, you know, knowing how well he's played in pockets, even this year, you know, it's just those little, you know, one game here, one game here where it's just, you know, he's noticeably just kind of out of it. Yes. And we have the conversation and, you know, we've talked about this and just in the NHL, there is this conversation about younger players who haven't had an 82 game season until this season and how that affects them. But I also really have to wonder, you know, we have Ekholm, he's 32 years old. He has been in this league for eons um, in hockey years. You know, he's been around. But I do wonder, you know, you look at some of these veteran players and you had this, you know, interrupted season in 2020, you had this coaching change before the suspended season and you had the bubble and then you had kind of the modified season last year. And there is a part of me that wonders, 
Is that a factor in how this season played out for even veterans? Because I feel like we talk about that in regards to these younger players, but, you know, not having the routine of 82 games in kind of the ebb and flow of off season on season in that, you know, there's a part of me that wonders, is that something that may be affected more than just the younger players? You know, somebody like Matias at home, could that be it? That's a fair point, you know, because this is the first 82 game season the Preds have played since 2018, 2019. Um, and, uh, you know, he said he was fine. You know, Matias mm -hmm. Ekholm said he was fine. He didn't feel fatigued or anything like that. But, you know, you watch the Predators, watch the Predators play towards the end of the year, you know, and the performance kind of, you know, peaked, you know, right around uh, – you know, around the time of the, the stadium series and then slowly yeah. kind of regressed from there. Um, you know, you do wonder maybe was that a factor uh, mm -hmm. in what the Nashville Predators were going through? Um, you know, another guy that we're going to talk about here in a second is, is Dante Fabro. This was his first 82 game season. Yes. Like his first full 82 game yes. season. Uh, that's something that I think surprised a lot of people because it seems like Fabro's kind of been in or around this team a while. Yes. So, you know, you have a lot of people that maybe aren't used to that. That's a factor. We'll talk about Dante Fabro in a second. Uh, before we get to the break, though, and I, I want to talk about Matias Eckholm's contract. Uh, yes. Because, remember, he was due to be an unrestricted free agent this year. Um, the right, horror. you know, sort of as the the season got underway, he signed a new deal with the Predators, mm -hmm. uh, a four year deal that starts this coming season that averages uh, to about six and a quarter million dollars per year in cap space. At the time, there is a lot of national writers, a lot of national people, mm -hmm. um, analytics people who kind of questioned that deal. Um, after the lens of this season, what do you think, Anne, of where the Predators are at with Ekholm and whether you think that extension will ultimately wind up being a good move for them? In the, you know, just looking through the lens of this past season, it maybe does not look as favorable as it did when they announced it back in October. Because again, this was sort of an inconsistent season for Matias Ekholm. Now, I will say that, you know, Ekholm is going to, I think he's a lifer pred for sure. And I think anything that they do moving forward, Matias Ekholm is a part of, you know, whether you were talking about competitive rebuild, full rebuild, you know, adding a few pieces and going after the cup chase. I don't think any of that happens in the next four years without Matias Ekholm. And so it makes sense to me. I think this year it feels a little more unsettled. That dollar amount feels a little more unsettled than maybe we would have liked it to feel. But I do think that you're going to get value from Matias Ekholm for this franchise for the next four years, for sure. And I don't think that really in the end, that's a huge overpay at all, but that's me. I don't know. I mean, how do you feel? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where even if the Predators go in a rebuild, I don't think Matias Ekholm is one of the people that go no. um, because even if, you know, let's say the Predators wind up tearing it down and going young, um, a, there's probably not going to be a lot of people that want that contract for Matias mm -hmm. Ekholm. Um, you know, unless, unless like, like we've said, you know, we know he plays very, very well. Like we know he is capable of being a very reliable top four defenseman. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if he plays that way next year, then, you know, this is, you know, that's, it's totally yeah. fine. It is a fine, yep. fair contract. Yes. Um, if the Predators struggle, if Matias Ekholm struggles, then all of a sudden you're, you know, maybe your opinion on a long-term rebuild changes, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it does become a problem. You think so? You're stuck with that. Um, now, granted, the Predators have a lot of cap space to play with, but considering all the contracts, uh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's probably not going to be a lot of people lining up to take that deal off of David Poyle's hands. Yeah. So to me, the answer really hinges on what do we see from Matias Ekholm the next couple of years? Yes, I would agree with that. I think it's hard. I, I don't think it's a fair evaluation to look at that contract just 
from this year and say, yeah, nope, they've overpaid and this is going to turn into a uh, Kyle Turris, you know, horrible, you know, kind of thing. It's not going to turn into that, of course. But, you know, people are not going to bemoan this. So I'm okay with it. And I think, you know, we're going to see consistent Matias at home next year. Like I really, I'm not, I, I am not concerned about Matias at home looking ahead. He's not a concern to me. Yeah. So one player though, that I will full disclosure has caused almost as much marital strife in this house as Matt Duchesne is Dante yes. Fabro. Yeah, there were there were words exchanged over Dante Fabro's performance. And we're going to take a look at his season coming up here in just a second. But first, want to let you know that this episode's brought to you by our great friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information. You can find all of the latest sports development, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup that we we are watching in our house faithfully. Of course, we still have the NHL conference finals in the East. Looking to see how that's all going to pan out. We have Major League Baseball going on and the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. You can head to their website today, or you can use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Now, moving on to moving Dante on. Fabro, uh, one of the most oft talked about players on the Nashville Predators team, especially on defense. Remember, mm -hmm. this was a guy who was the Predators' first round pick, mm -hmm. you know, back in uh, back in the mid 2000s or 2010s. Uh, he was a guy who David Poyle and Peter Laviolette at the time were so impressed by his play that they traded PK Subban. He was thrown into the fire. Yes, he you was. You ask me way too soon mm -hmm. um not you know looking back not since ryan Souter has have the predators asked so much yes of a rookie defenseman as they did fabro you know jumping into that top four you know even seth jones when predators drafted seth jones seth jones was kind of the team's fifth sixth defenseman yes you know yeah Fabro was really thrown in to the Nashville Predators lineup and he did well under those circumstances, but I feel like he has been set up for missed expectations by the fan base because of that, because he did well when he was thrown in. And I think people forget this is a young player. He's 23 years old, you know, and this is his first, we talked about it, his first 82 game season. So I think we, Dante Fabro does not receive the grace that a young, growing, developing defenseman deserves because of the way he jumped into this Predators lineup. I think it's been a much trickier road for Fabro than a lot of other defensemen in the league. And overall, I think he's handled it fairly well, but he does get a lot of heat. Like, he gets a lot of criticism. Yeah. It's some of that is fair. Some, some of that of is not. I think a lot of the big problems, Anne, is that he hasn't quite become the player that Predators fans thought he was going to become. You know, I think, you know, when you watched him in Boston College, when you hear about or at Boston University, mm -hmm. um, when you kind of go back and read his draft profiles, I think they kind of had this vision um, almost of like a Ryan Ellis light so to speak, where he just kind of this really solid two-way guy, you know, very good offensive guy, uh, very reliable on the defensive end. I thought that's kind of what fans thought they were getting. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, as it's, it's become more clear that he may not ever develop into that guy. You, you don't know? think? I don't. I mean, this was a career season for him offensively, uh, mm -hmm. three goals, 21 assists. You know, we, you saw him get a little bit more responsibility offensively, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's ever going to be like, you know, putting up 40, 50 points a year. Um, that's me. Like that is yeah. me watching his game. 
But here's the thing about Dante Fabro, and I still think, you know, just because he doesn't develop into what you think he's going to, that doesn't mean he doesn't have value for you. And I would agree. Yeah. We saw that a lot this year. You know, Dante Fabro was kind of, you know, one of the very few guys that you could always count on in the defensive zone to sort of make the right play. Um, and it was a lot of stuff that didn't necessarily show up on the score sheet, maybe not on the analytic charts, but just very smart hockey plays, you know, mm -hmm. like, Hey, if there's a rebound, he wouldn't like, you know, try to wildly clear or anything like that or knock somebody out of the way. Um, he would kind of, you know, just make the smart play, tip it behind the net reset. Um, you know, I thought his zone exits were pretty strong. You know, Ekholm, or not Ekholm, but Fabro is the guy who is a very, very strong skater um, yes. and uses that to kind of help him defensively. So there is a lot to Dante Fabro's game, which if the Predators use him right, mm -hmm. that's that can kind of be a home run guy for you. Yeah. And I think we saw some little things in his game that are very promising. You know, one of the things that the Nashville Predators kind of focused on defensively were blocked shots. And Dante Fabro was excellent at blocking shots. He had 105 blocked shots this season. He was tied for third best on the roster with Roman Yossi. Um, and he had less uh, time average time on ice than Yossi did. So, you know, he was really in there blocking shots aggressively that way. Um, defensively, I thought he did fairly well. But I also, I go back to, he just hasn't had enough time. And I feel like there are people who are ready to kind of write not necessarily write him off, but reset their expectations for him already. And you think, you know, he came in and, and, you know, he's had sort of this n not had an 82 game season till this year. And he didn't have an 82 game season this year. You know, he had um, like 66 games, I think. So you're looking at a player who really didn't get a full um, he didn't get a full season in because of injury. So I still feel like we've got plenty of time to see Fabro grow into these ex early expectations. I, I really do. But, you know, there are some areas of his game that that he needs to clean up and, and work on for sure. But I think that's going to come with time. And, and he needs a little more. So what's the expectation from you for him this year? Like, coming do up? You, do you, yeah, like coming up for mm -hmm. him this year. Like, do you see him taking that next step? Or is he going to continue to kind of be a longer term project? I think he's going to continue. I think we're going to continue to see growth in him. It's interesting to me because you're also plugging in Dante Fabro a lot of times in a, on a pairing with Roman Yossi. And that's going to develop an entirely different skill set for Fabro mm -hmm. than a lot of pairings because you're playing with one of the best defensemen in the league who plays, you know, a pretty strong offensive game. So I think there's so much opportunity for growth for Fabro coming up this next season. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not concerned terribly about him. Do I wish that he had maybe continued to blossom like we saw, you know, kind of really strong performance when he first hit the ice? Yes. But do I think he's on the wrong track? No, I, I think he's going to be all right. Uh, uh, I think you might be right. Like, I think you I might be right. So. And I, I, I do like the idea of a Yossi Fabro pairing uh, kind of being the Predators main pairing going forward, because as we mentioned, um, you know, if Dante Fabro continues kind of being that smart defensive stay at home guy that can really, you know, enable Roman Yossi to go forth and sort of be that free flowing, um, almost fourth forward kind of player. Yes. The Predators want him to be. Um, yeah. So, and uh, final report cards, final mm -hmm. grades. Uh, let's start with Matthias Ekholm. What grade do you give Ekholm? Okay. And full disclosure, I'm the teacher that is bumping the grade up because he's a teacher's pet, but I'm giving him a B plus <laughs> because he's solid. You know, he did have an up and down year. I know it should maybe be a lower grade than that, but he's Swedish. So he's getting a B plus. 
Okay. Well, <laughs> yay, Swedes, I guess. I mean, look, I'm I'm fully like I fully play favorites. I'm gonna be real about it. I I yeah. I, I bumped it up. So I don't know. What do you Matias Ekholm, what do you give him? Whew. I thought I thought about this one for a while. Yeah. And I think for me, I would have to give Matias Ekholm a C plus. Okay. He, you know, again, it's it's the inconsistencies. And I think where mm-hmm. he loses a letter grade from me is we know he's capable of more. Like we know he mm-hmm. is capable of more than he did this year. Again, at times, fantastic. But we didn't see that consistency from him, which is something the Predators absolutely needed to, him to have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we didn't see that sort of playmaking impact on the second power play. And again, not, you know, I don't think you can pin all of that on him, but I think you right. do have to kind of um, penalize him for that somewhat. So yeah. to me, you know, Matthias Ekholm, yeah, like on paper, a lot of things to like about this season, but he just didn't have that impact that we wanted him to have. So yeah, for, for me, I have to go C+. Plus. Does your C plus reflect how you feel like his next season might be? Are you concerned about his next season? I mean, I am from the mm-hmm. same standpoint. I'm concerned about everybody on the Nashville yeah. Predators, you know, <laughs> uh, as I, I'm concerned for, you know, Roman Yossi and Matt Duchesne, Philip Forsberg, if he's back, it's like, can you do the exact same thing again this year? You know, mm-hmm. it's one thing to kind of come forth and have this wild record setting season it's another thing to be able to do this consistently year in and year out and get your team closer to contender status that's not something um, anybody on this predators team has proven they can do yet so you know that's that's, fair that is something to be concerned about um all right dante fabro final letter grade for him dante fabro i'm gonna give him a b minus um because i feel like he is where he should be in uh, in a traditional developmental sense. Um, you know, I, I hate that my husband was wrong about him and grumbled about him as much as he did. So I also bumped, the, bumped up the grade a little bit for that because I really do feel like Fabro is where he should be for his experience, his age and all of that. So I have, I have extra grace for Fabro. He's a B minus for me. What about you? Yeah. I I think that's right. B minus. Yeah. Um, you know, he's for the job you needed him to do this year, overall very did it. He did it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to maybe see him do a little bit better, you know, developing a two-way game. I don't know if that's going to happen, but if this is gonna be the expectation for Dante Fabro every year, then yeah, I mean it's it, it it's is not what it bad. Is. No, it's yeah. not bad. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head as we do grades. And as we look ahead to next season, I think the word is consistency. You know, we'll see. Yeah, we will definitely have to see. Uh, Mm -hmm. All right. More player report cards coming up uh, throughout the season. We'll have Ryan Johansson next. uh, And then we will get in uh, to some group ones. We'll Mm -hmm. talk about the fourth line. We'll talk about the herd line, the rest of the defensemen, the goaltenders we will discuss as a group. Um, and yeah, so, so stay tuned for that. And, uh, where can the five people find your work online? You can find my work at on the and you can find me on Twitter at Ann K underscore mama on ice. I'm Nick Morgan. You can find me at on the Follow me on Twitter at underscore NS Morgan. Uh, also be sure to follow the podcast while you're there at L O underscore predators. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe and leave a comment. Let us know what you thought of today's show. That's going to do it for us on the lockdown predators podcast. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We will be back uh, tomorrow with a new episode.